Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, as always, and now we will continue with our reading and discussion of the book, The History of Romanism by John Dowling. This is Chapter 5. This is a very important chapter in this book. I hope my listeners can understand my reading and my commentary because this is critical to our understanding of who is the counterfeit King of Kings and Lord of Lords in the world. Remember, heretofore in this book, we've learned how the papacy clawed and struggled to achieve the title Universal Bishop, the Chief Bishop the bishop of bishops, the prince of all the bishops, all the bishops of the world, answer to the Pope. He is head of all the churches. And now, he, at at, at this point, he is only a spiritual sovereign. But the papacy, in order to achieve its universal status in the world must now become a king and eventually the king of kings just as he is bishop of bishops he must claw and scratch and dig his way to greater and greater power until he achieves the global status of king of kings now this is the recording the historical account of how the papacy, who at the time of the 8th century was simply a bishop, the bishop of bishops, the lord of lords, now he is about to become a king. Just one stepping stone to becoming the king of kings. This is uh, 756 A.D., this is chapter 5, And it is entitled, The Pope Finally Becomes a Temporal Sovereign. He becomes a king in 756 A.D. This is subsection 43, and we'll begin on page 165 if you're following along in the reading. The author says the popes, although seizing every opportunity to exalt their own authority, had not, up until the commencement of the 8th century, ventured the attempt to excite rebellion against the ancient emperors or to wield in their own hands the scepter of temporal sovereignty. In the present chapter, we are to follow them, that is the popes, in their career of ambition till they finally united the regal crown, that is the temporal crown, a king's crown, to the episcopal mitre and took rank among the kings of the earth. Okay, This is the study of the facts of history where it is recorded that the Pope first became a king on the earth. He continues now. He says, We've already referred to the rebellious tumults excited at Rome and encouraged by Pope Gregory II when in 730 A.D. the edict of the Emperor Leo was promulgated in joining or enforcing the destruction of images. Okay, that was the decree from the Emperor Leo that throughout the the Roman Empire, all images, all religious images and idols would be destroyed. That imagery and idolatry would be forbidden. Okay, he was doing God's work. Now it says, from that time forward until the coronation of Charlemagne in 800 A.D., the government of the city of Rome and the surrounding territory was administered only nominally in the name of the emperors of the East, while the real power was vested in the popes, sustained as they were by the ignorant and superstitious multitudes. Okay, now let me explain, make sure you don't miss the point here. Rome at that time and the western portion of the empire were largely in rebellion against the emperors stationed in Constantinople because the papacy supported the use of images and idols for worship. 
directly against the the script the council of scriptures forbidding imagery and idolatry the papacy the man of sin demanded the worship of images and idols contrary to what was decided by the emperors of the east and their patriarchs in Constantinople so the west was in rebellion against the east and it was at this time that the papacy in the west the antichrist was uh, prevailed among the people and the people supported the use of images and idols and they rebelled in that respect against the ancient emperors of the of the Roman Empire. So we have the Pope literally becoming a king, asserting himself as the king over the West. Now, everybody knows the Pope doesn't have an army, the Pope doesn't have a military, he doesn't have a navy, and he can't support a rebellion like that. So he has to get his power another way. So Leo, the emperor, is only nominally considered to be the king of the West, while the real power was held in the hands of the pope in the West. So we have the pope struggling for temporal authority, but unable to sustain it militarily. Okay? And it says, from that time forward until the coronation of Charlemagne in 800 A.D., the government of the city of Rome and the surrounding territory was administered only nominally, only partially, in the name of the emperors of the East, while the real power was vested in the popes, sustained as they were by the ignorant and superstitious multitudes. Now, listen, what did this author just tell you? He said the, the real power was vested in the popes and his power was sustained by the ignorant and superstitious masses. Now what if all of a sudden the ignorant and superstitious multitudes finally realized that the pope was not the vicar of Christ or the replacement of the Son of God as he claims, but was the Antichrist? the counterfeit Christ, the enemy of Christ, the arch enemy of Christ, would they still be ignorant and superstitious? Or would they rebel against the popes as they had rebelled against the emperor? The answer is obvious. It was by the power of of the ignorant and superstitious multitudes that the papacy maintained and sustained his, his pretended power. The papacy has no legitimate power in this world, is not even able to maintain his own authority, but with the help and acquiescence of ignorant and superstitious multitudes. It remains so today, just as it was in 800 A.D. Had the multitudes, the ignorant and superstitious multitudes, all of a sudden had the light of Scripture, and positively, as I have done and as others have done, the Protestants did, recognize that the papacy is a man-made institution, not a divinely ordained institution, that all of his power, both spiritual and temporal, are impostures and that in fact he is the idolatrous rebellious, uh, rebellious counterfeit of Christ seeking to replace Christ in this world both over spiritual things and over temporal things and all of a sudden the ignorant and superstitious masses would have come to the light of the truth the light of the scripture positively, as I have done and many other Protestants have done, has positively identified this pope, this papacy, from the first pope to the last as the Antichrist of Scripture, then the whole world would have abandoned him. 
he would have had no power, no one to uphold his pretensions. The world would ignore him, and he would therefore have no power at all. Listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. It's the same thing that this author has just told you. The papacy has no power at all in this world except the power that the people voluntarily give him. When someone walks into you, to a room and starts demanding all the occupants of that room to do thus or so, the people have a choice. They either obey him or they don't. And if they obey him, then he becomes their Lord and Master. If they don't, then he is nothing. He must turn about right there in the doorway and walk right back out the way he came. If all the people looked at that man and said, You are the Antichrist. You are the counterfeit Christ. You are a pretense. You have no power, no authority. And not only will we not do what you say, we will destroy you. That's the choice. We either obey him or we don't. It's the same choice that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden when the serpent beguiled Eve and say, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that the day you eat of the, true, the, the fruit of this tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be as gods, knowing both good and evil. And when they obeyed him, he became their God. And they did surely die, and we die to this day because of that great mistake. The same choice is given us every day. Are we going to obey Christ, or are we going to obey Antichrist? Because if we don't obey the Antichrist, he has no power. It's only our power that sustains him. If we give him no power, no authority, no strength, then he withers away like the grass in the noonday sun. Listen again to what the author tells you here. He said the real power in the West was vested in the popes. And that power was sustained by the ignorant and superstitious multitudes. It's still so today. Now, listen to this. In 800 A.D., we're talking about the first account in history where the papacy for the very first time became a king over a given portion of land. The sole governor over a single portion of land. Today, because of the ignorance of the superstitious multitudes, the papacy has elevated himself to not only a king, but a king of kings. Not only a king of kings, but lord of lords. In other words, a global sovereign. King of kings and lord of lords. He has all power over spiritual things and temporal things only because the people, the ignorant and superstitious masses, grant him that power. Now, remember our reading and discussion of the book, The Global Vatican, by Francis Rooney, A Knight of Malta? Do, we, do you remember how the Knight of Malta, uh, Francis Rooney, ambassador to the Holy See for the United States under President George W. Bush, outlined all the power that the papacy has? That he controls both domestic and foreign policy for this country? and other countries in the world, that he maintains observer status even over the United Nations? What Francis Rooney was trying to tell the world without actually using the term was that the Pope is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, universal spiritual and temporal sovereign in the world. And that the only governments in this world 
that are legitimate are those that answer to the papacy and take instruction from the papacy and do as the papacy says. Those are called du jour governments. And they have full communion with the Holy Roman Pontiff, the Antichrist of the Bible, Scripture and History. But those governments which rebel against the papacy and do not do what the papacy says and do not give their power and strength to the papacy... They are de facto governments that may be removed at the whim of the Pope whenever it's convenient. Regime change. That's all spelled out in Francis Rooney's book. Francis Rooney, in the content of his book, we can derive a different title than he gave the book. The Global Vatican was the title of the book. A little bit obscure, isn't it? What the title of the book really is, the papacy, the global, spiritual, and temporal sovereign in the world. The content of Francis Rooney's book defies the title that he gave the book. The title that he gave the book is incomplete. But he gives the completeness in the text of his book. Now this author, this author gives us the truth. The papacy has no power on earth, either spiritual or temporal, except by the ignorant and superstitious multitudes. If the papacy in a day, had no followers, he would dry up like the grass in the noonday sun. That's all the world would have to do. Ignore him. And he would wither like a dried plant. It's our power and the kings of the earth who give to him their power and strength that the papacy is maintained. In a day, if all of that power, all of that strength was taken away from the papacy, he would just have to dismiss himself. He would have no power in the world. That's just how simple it would be to destroy the Antichrist. He would be destroyed without hand. Without hand. There would be no need for violence. The papacy can't even defend itself. It doesn't have an army. It has no power to impose its will, either spiritual or temporal, upon anyone outside the walls of that city. Now that's the ghastly truth. And yet the whole world, the Bible plainly says, the whole world wanders after the beast. Why? Because we voluntarily, ignorantly, and superstitiously acknowledge him as King of kings and Lord of lords. The governments of the world acknowledge him as the King of kings and Lord of lords. But we're getting ahead of the reading. What we're reading is the historical account of the very first time in human history where the papacy first achieved king status in the world. Now he says, from that time forward until the coronation of Charlemagne in 800 AD, the government of the city of Rome and the surrounding territory was administered only nominally in the name of the emperors of the east, while the real power was vested in the popes, sustained as they were by the ignorant and superstitious multitudes. Quote, after the prohibition of picture worship, that's imagery and idolatry, says the historian Geisler, the city of Rome was in a state of rebellion against the emperors, though without an absolute separation from the empire. Okay, They were in rebellion, but they were still lawfully subjects of the Roman emperor. That includes the pope as well. 
Now from this they were withheld by the, that is, completely withdrawing from the empire, declaring themselves independent and sovereign, apart from Constantinople, apart from the Emperor Leo, and apart from the Patriarch of Constantinople, they refused to do. To break completely away from the East, they refused to do or couldn't do because for fear of the Lombards, who under the, under the King Lutprand were waiting only for a favorable opportunity to extend their sway over Rome, as well as the Exarchate, and whose purpose it was the great object of the popes to defeat. Okay, if it were not for the threat posed to Rome and Ravenna against the, uh, from the Lombards, the papacy might well have completely separated from the empire. But they needed to maintain at least some relationship with Constantinople in order to defend themselves against the Lombards under the lieutenant or the king Lutprand. All right? You see God's hand at work in this? I do, and you will too by the time this is over. But Lutprand, the king of the Lombards, was going to attack the Exarchate in Ravenna. In Ravenna was the Exarchate. He was the, the, the remote king of the West under Leo. He was Leo's representative. He was Leo's ambassador. He was Leo's link of control. In other words, the Exarch of Ravenna, Ravenna was literally the kingdom of of the Roman Empire under a vicar. All right. Leo maintained control of the West through his exarchate in Ravenna. All right. It's a remote government, an extension of Constantinople within the Roman the Western Roman Empire. This was the way that the the emperor of the east in Constantinople maintained control of the west. The, exarch of, the exarchate of Ravenna was the government of Constantinople in Ravenna. So when King Lutprand of the Lombards threatened the exarchate, what he was doing was rebelling against the legitimate government of Leo in Constantinople. It was a coup. It was an attempted coup to separate, listen to this, the one iron leg in Daniel's prophecy from the other iron leg. To split the, the, the Roman Empire into two independents. But the image that Daniel gives us in his metal man image, those two legs are iron. They are Roman. They're not separate. They support the whole image. And not only that, but they trample the clay. The people of God. They trample over the people of God. Lutprand of the Lombards, whatever you think of him, is being used by God to maintain Daniel's prophecy. This is the hand of Almighty God. Now, Lutprand and the Lombards were simply waiting for an opportunity to overthrow the Exarchate in Ravenna and then go after Rome. So Rome needs to maintain her relationship with Constantinople. We'll be back right after this. Years ahead of the dominant media, FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. 
There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. All right, welcome to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you'd like to support this program, please support First Amendment Radio. Now, the papal posterior is up to its navel in alligators. It's made itself an enemy of Emperor Leo and the, and the patriarchs of Constantinople in their demand for images and idols in the churches and all over the West. But Lutprand and the, the king of the Lombards stands ready at any moment, whenever the opportunity arises, to overthrow both the Exarchate of Ravenna and the papacy and to be king of the West. So the Pope, knowing that he has no militia, no way to defend himself, has to maintain some level of uh, decorum with the Emperor Leo in the, in the East in case the Lombards attack. So, the Pope is, you know trying to make the best of a very, very bad situation. It's it's just the life of a pope is miserable. You know, trying to scratch and dig and claw his way to power when he's got so many, so much opposition. You've got to ask yourself, with this storm bearing down on Rome, If the Pope really were King of Kings and Lord of Lords, like our Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, wouldn't he just simply say to the storm, Peace, be still? But no, the Pope has to maintain, at least for as long as necessary, a relationship with Emperor Leo in the East until the Lombards are defeated or taken away or somehow won over by the Pope 
Jews. And then the Pope can continue his campaign of elevating himself to King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He can't just say to the storm, peace be still, because we know even the elements obey Christ. And he proved it when he said to the storm, peace be still. The storm was stilled. But the Pope doesn't have that kind of power because he's not Christ nor the vicar of Christ. He is a pretension in the world. He has no power at all except his all-powerful signs and lying wonders and his lies in hypocrisy. And this is the epitome of hypocrisy. When the papacy refuses Emperor Leo's dictates and maintains images and idols in the churches against the wishes of the, of the Roman emperor, and then depends upon the Roman emperor Leo for defense against the Lombards. Lies in hypocrisy. Okay? It says, from this they were withheld by fear of the Lombards who under Lutprand were waiting only for a favorable opportunity to extend their sway over Rome as well as the Exarchate in Ravenna and whose purpose it was the great object of the popes to defeat. Okay, the most pressing issue for the papacy right now is to defeat the Lombards. Now, in the year 734, the emperor sent an army and a fleet to reduce to submission the pope and the refractory Romans and to enforce the execution of his decree against images. But as nearly all his vessels were lost at sea, the attempt was abandoned. And from this time forward, says the historian Bauer, quote, the emperor concerned himself no more with the affairs of the West than the Pope did of those of the East. Okay? The Pope ignored, or rather, the emperor ignored the pleas of the Pope. You've rebelled against me. You've maintained these ungodly images and idols in the churches. And now you fear Lutprand. And you want me to defend you? Off with you, and your images, and your idols. So the Pope has to look somewhere else for help. Because he can't defend himself. He can't call the seas to be quiet and to be still. He has to find the strength of man to uphold his power. Someone who is ignorant and superstitious to maintain his power. It says the exarch, or the emperor's viceroy, continued still to reside in Ravenna, but was not in a condition to cause the imperial edict against images to be observed even in that city, much less to undertake anything against the pope or the people of Rome, who had now withdrawn themselves from subjection to the emperor and were governed by magistrates of their own election. Quote, forming a kind of republic under the Pope, not yet as their prince, but only as their head. So clearly, the historians record that the papacy had literally created himself into a de facto government. It was a government in fact, but according to the emperor in the east and the, and the exarchate in Ravenna, he was no government at all and should have been overthrown. But the emperor in the east and the exarchate in Ravenna were incapable. They couldn't even enforce the laws against imagery and idolatry. Neither could they pre, uh, 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 muster a, an army and a navy to come and fight the Lombards. So the Pope's up to his papal behind in alligators. You wouldn't think that condition could exist for a vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, the successor of the Apostle Peter, but that's the way it was. The Pope was a beggar. He was reduced to begging for help. 
Now, subsection 41, page 166, or rather, subsection 44, I misspoke. It says, in the year 740, in consequence of the Pope refusing to deliver up two rebellious dukes, the subjects of Lutpran, king of the Lombards, like warlike, uh, li- that warlike monarch invaded and laid waste to the territories of Rome. In their distress, their fear of the resentment of the emperor forbidding them to apply to him for assistance they urgently needed, they resolved to apply to the celebrated Charles Martel, the great hero of that age who had received that surname, Martel, which signifies hammer. Okay, Charles the Hammer, in consequence of a celebrated victory gained over the Saracen forces near Poitiers in 732 A.D., by which he had probably saved his native country, France, from being subjected under the Mohammedan rule. Okay? So the Pope has been literally told to stuff it up your papal posterior. The Emperor Leo is not going to come rescue the Pope and his pretensions against the against the King of the Lut, uh, King Lutprand of the Lombards. So the Pope has to beg for another help, and it just happens to be Charles Martel of France, a military conqueror who had been in battle with the Mohammedans and had won a tremendous battle in Poitiers. And so the Pope relies now upon Charles. Now let's see how he manages and manipulates Charles. He says Charles was at this time mayor of the palace to the king of France, but wielded in his own person all the power of the kingdom. Okay? Okay, so Charles is called mayor of the palace of the king in France, but he wielded in his own person the power of the kingdom. In other words, he was the most powerful man in France. The real king of France was lazy and just just, uh, transferred all of his power to Charles. And though he only had the title mayor, he was in fact the king. All right? Now it says to him... Charles Martel, therefore Pope Gregory III dispatched the most urgent and pressing entreaties to hasten to his aid. Now here's how the Vicar of Christ appeals to Charles Martel for help. Quote, Shut not your ears, my most Christian son, writes Pope Gregory. Shut not your ears to do to our prayers lest the prince of the apostles should shut the gates of the kingdom of heaven upon you, unquote. So the, you see, do you see the power that the papacy is trying to wield upon Charles Martel, threatening to close the kingdom of heaven against Charles Martel if he doesn't come to the rescue of the prince of the apostles, the vicar of Christ on earth? That's the superstition that the papacy imposes upon the ignorant masses and the ignorant governments of the world to elevate his power. Like I told you, if no one acknowledged the Pope as anything in this world, his power would literally dry up. Now, we've seen already the Emperor Leo telling the Pope to stuff it up his, his mitre So the Pope has to go somewhere else to find a superstitious and ignorant king to uphold him. And he uses a threat. Shut not your ears, my most Christian son, says the Pope. Shut not your ears to our prayers, lest the prince of the apostles should shut the gates of the kingdom of heaven upon you. Unquote. The Pope had sent Charles Martel his usual royal present of the keys of the tomb of St. Peter and some of the filings from supposedly Peter's chain inserted with the gift. And appealing to these, he adds in his letter, quote, I conjure you by the sacred keys of the tomb of St. Peter, which I sent you, 
prefer not the friendship of the Lombard kings. To that regard you owe to the prince of the apostles. Unquote. How eloquent, right? Think Charles Martel paid any mind to this pretender in Rome? He'd already received the gift of the keys of St. Peter's tomb there in the basement of St. Peter's Basilica. And Charles Martel's not impressed. The author says in subsection 45, Whether it was, however, that the stern warrior did not attach much value to these wonder-working keys or the filings, or whether he was unwilling to offend the king of the Lombards, it is certain that he turned a deaf ear to these pathetic appeals of the Pope. Charles Martel, the last hope for the Pope, has turned a deaf ear to the Pope's cries. Would to God that the kings of the earth did likewise today, wouldn't you? Now look what happens. He says, the, he, says, he says, let me find my place. Whether it was, however, that the stern warrior, Charles Martel, did not attach much value to these wonder-working keys and filings, or whether he was unwilling to offend the king of the Lombards, it is certain that he turned a deaf ear to these pathetic appeals of the Pope, till the latter, the Pope, despairing of gaining his help by appealing to his piety and superstition, attacked him in a more vulnerable part by appealing to his ambition. Okay? So the Pope can't threaten Charles Martel with shutting up the, king, the, the, the kingdom of heaven against him. That doesn't impress Martel. He's not superstitious. He doesn't believe the Pope as much. But if the Pope can give, Greg, uh, can give Charles Martel what he really wants, then he might get Charles Martel's help. And here is what this begging, pathetic Antichrist does. He pretends that he has the power to make Charles Martel the Emperor of the West. Okay? He says the latter, the Pope, despairing of gaining Charles Martel's help by appealing to his piety or superstition, attacked him in a more vulnerable part by appealing to his ambition. This Pope Gregory did by proposing to Charles that he and the Romans would renounce all allegiance to the Emperor in the East as an avowed heretic and acknowledge him, Charles Martel, for their protector, confer upon him consular dignity in Rome upon condition that he should protect the Pope, the Church, and the Roman people against the Lombards, and if necessary, and if necessity should arise, even defend the Pope and Rome against the vengeance of their ancient master, the Emperor." So by flattering words, with power that the Pope does not have, offers the whole Western Christian part of the Roman Empire to Charles Martel. Since he wasn't flattered by threats of, of uh, since he wasn't impressed by threats of having the gates of heaven shut up against him, he fell for the ploy that the Pope had some power in order to make him, Charles Martel, the Emperor of the West. That he would even share his dignity with Charles Martel right there in Rome. So long as he protected the Pope and the Church and the Roman people against the Lombards. And if necessary, even to defend the Pope, the Romans against the vengeance of their ancient master, the emperor. Now these proposals, says the author, were more suitable 
to the warlike and ambitious disposition of Charles Martel, and he immediately dispatched his ambassadors to Rome to take the Pope under his protection, intending, doubtless, at an early period, to consummate the agreement. All right? Now, what do you suppose Charles Martel has in mind to consummate this agreement? To be made the Emperor of the West to split the Roman Empire in two, to become independent of Leo in the East. And who do you suppose Charles Martel was willing to get down on his knees before and to have that crown placed upon his head? The Pope, who has no power at all to either make kings or take kings. No power whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the papacy is in direct opposition, direct rebellion, in a position of a coup against the legitimate government, uh, Emperor Leo in the East. All right. Pope Gregory, however, did not live to carry into effect his treasonable purpose. Charles Martel either to profit by it or the Emperor Leo to hear about it. It didn't go through. He says they all three died in that year in 741 A.D. within a few weeks of each other. You see God's hand in this? I do. He says before the death of Martel, his timely interference had procured the Romans a brief respite from their invaders, the, 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 uh, the Lombards. For soon after the arrival of his messengers at Rome, the Lombard king retired with his troops to his own dominions, though he still retained the four cities he had, he had taken belonging to the Roman dukedom. Upon the almost simultaneous death of these three noted individuals, the emperor was succeeded by Constantine, the pope by Pope Zachary, and the mayor of the palace by his son Pepin as the nominal mayor, but the real sovereign of France. So we have a whole new cast of characters. But the play goes on, as written, as prophesied. So we have a brand new emperor in Constantinople. His name is Constantine. We have a brand new pope in Rome. His name is Zachary. And we have a brand new surrogate king in France named Pepin. Now, the new Pope Gregory, this is subsection 46, the new Pope Zachary was immediately ordained without waiting for his election to be confirmed, either by the emperor in the east or his Italian representative, the exarch of Ravenna. So the Pope ascended his papal throne without, being, without any consideration at all for the eastern uh, uh, pat uh, patriarch or the eastern emperor. And it says, the imperial power in Italy being at this time reduced to so low an ebb that the emperor had no power to resist this encroachment upon his right of confirming the universal bishop, a right which his predecessors had claimed and enjoyed throughout, with, without interruption ever since the decree of the emperor Focus had created that dignity. Okay? So this is a new precedent in the world. Emperor Focus elevates the Pope to universal bishop, although maintaining the exarchate of Ravenna to finally give the approval of the emperor before the Pope ascends his throne, once elected. Now the papacy elevates himself, sits upon the throne without anyone's approval. I mean, after all, if you're going to be the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, you shouldn't have much respect for the law of the kings, should you? Okay, this is rebellion, open rebellion. And it, so, it says, soon after his ordination, Pope Zachary visited in person the camp of Lutpron, the king of the Lombards, who upon the death of Charles Martel was preparing again to invade the territories of Rome and had influence sufficient by threatening him with eternal damnation if he refused and the favor of St. Peter if he complied to prevail on him to deliver up the four cities he had taken, which he accordingly did, declaring in the presence of all that, no long, that they no longer belonged to him but the Apostle St. Peter. 
All right? Without saying a word of the emperor, who, if anyone, was without doubt their rightful master and sovereign. Okay. So the new Pope Zachary musters up some papal ambition and some papal courage and goes to the very tent of this Lombard king, Lutpran, and threatens him with eternal damnation and promises him eternal bliss in heaven if he releases the four cities that he had taken in a previous campaign to overthrow the empire, but not to give those cities back to the emperor in the east who, to whom they rightfully belonged, but to give them to the pope, thereby making the pope a king. You see where this is going? This is the hand of Almighty God. This is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. The counterfeit king of kings and the Lord of lords, previous to this, had enjoyed Lord of lords status, had overthrown Christ's rightful throne. But now he is taking upon himself a kingly status in the world by lying wonders and hypocrisy. Lying hypocrisy condemning this Lombard king of taking cities that didn't belong to him, but that belonged to the, to the emperor of Constantinople. And then when he finally makes this superstitious and ignorant king shake in his boots in the presence of the so-called apostle of St. Peter, he demands that he not return those four cities to the emperor, but he give them to the pope himself. Lies in hypocrisy. Bible prophecy fulfilled. Now, the king of the Lombards doesn't maintain his ignorance for very long. When he gets back to his tent, he realizes that he's been swindled, that the pope didn't have the power to take those cities. They belonged to the emperor and that his threats were empty. He was a false king, and so he reneges on the deal, just like we all should do. Realize the Pope has no power in this world and rebel against him. We'll be back tomorrow to tell the rest of the story. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. I'll see you then. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, 
EPUB or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.